Okay. All right. So I wanted to start, Mr. Williams, um, by talking about your own education, um, since education is what we are focused on. And um, I, I was reading that you entered the public school system in uh, Richmond, Virginia, at a time when I believe segregation was still the law of the land. Um, and then, you know, during your education, there was the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case where the Supreme Court ruled that school segregation violated the Constitution. But I'm curious, what, what was it like for you first attending segregated schools? And then did you see any changes, if, if any, um, after the Brown ruling? <clears throat> Well, I wrote a book called Unfinished Agenda. There it is. <laughs> Urban politics in the era of black power. And one of the stories I tell is uh, in Richmond, everything was segregated, of course, that right down to the water fountains. But one day they decided to uh, desegregate the school, I'm sorry, the city buses. So my mother and father instructed us to be cool. This was the day. And of course, as young people, we were going to make sure we sat in the front of the bus. So we did it. We sat as close to the bus driver as we possibly could. And uh, we were in uh, junior high school at that time, what they call middle school now. And every day we took that bus. The older people looked at us and just were afraid. They were afraid for us, afraid for them. They just didn't know what was going to happen. They went to the back of the bus mm. when we sat there. And we had this bus driver whose neck got just as red as he could. We could see that from our vantage point. We were just giggling and teeheeing. And outside, the, the, the people who we passed looked at us with awe. Hmm. Because we had done something that they were not able to do. And, and throughout my, my actions, in the South, that was that was true also in uh, Montgomery, much later when we challenged the voter rights situation. And I eventually went to jail there, went to state prison. Mm -hmm. But the older people held back, the younger people charged forward. So that was basically my experience with desegregation, desegregating anything. Because after the uh, surreal war off, we went right back to the back of the bus where we could cackle and key -hee and not worry about what those older people were saying about us as they looked at us with stern warnings in their looks. Uh, but not that day, not hmm. on that day. They, they, we were leading them. Wow. And did that, did that ring true to you that the ruling that separate facilities are inherently unequal, whether it's buses or schools, that there was some, that just the, even if the facilities themselves were somehow equal, that just the act of separating people by race just creates a sense of inferiority or inequality? Well, yes, that was true. And that's what uh, desegregation was all about. We were, we were treated as, in, as second class citizens and we were branded as second class citizens by the facilities that were made available to us. Because separate was never equal. Mm. Those, those water fountains were never equal to the nice new shiny white water fountain. My mother first told my brother and I to drink from the white water down in uh, Suffolk, Virginia, much <laughs> earlier. And then she argued with the, uh, with the, with the, with the, with the uh, not with the police, but with the store lady who came forward to defend white honor and privilege. And we got a great big thrill out of that. That was my first act of resistance. And I owe that to my mother. Hmm. Uh, that's also in the book. It, and is she uh, a source then of some of your, uh, your ability to kind of challenge, challenge power structures like that? Yes. 
Yes, that was uh, my mother and my father. My father also challenged the power structure in the school district because uh, he was the band director at my high school. I was in the band, my brother was in the band. As a matter of fact, he was the first black music director in the city of Richmond. Hmm. Uh, he, he was a, a legendary uh, band director. We had one of the best, if not the best, I will say that, band in the city. Hmm. Uh, they wanted to keep us in the back of the uh, tobacco festival parade, which was a big annual harvest time thing, Virginia tobacco processing in uh, Richmond, Marlboro, Lucky Strike, whatever. Um, and my father and the other black band director at Walker, we were at Armstrong High School, they were at Walker High School. Uh, they said we weren't gonna march as long as the uh, it was segregated. Mm. And they got away with it. But one day, one day we got the, the word that uh, they were gonna desegregate the parade, white, black, white, black, or black, white, black, white, whatever. No, they certainly were gonna put us at the front. So the, uh, bay were, the, the, the parade was integrated or desegregated, I should say, uh, with the two white high schools and the two black high schools uh, being apart. So, uh, and, and that was part of my unfinished agenda, if you will. Once again, a reference to my book. Am I putting a plug in for the book? Yes, I am. But I'm also telling you the story, answering the questions that you asked, because we gathered at this, these four corners getting ready to go into the line of march. Two white bands, two black bands. And so we were warming up. And so the uh, white bands were warming up with the drums and we listened to their little drums and then we, sh we shot them dead. <laughs> <laughs> we killed them. They, we wowed them. Uh, uh, I don't know what, not, not white supremacy was at least temporarily derailed that day <laughs> when he heard the, the drummers of Armstrong and Walker. And we just marched so gloriously. My father was marching along. You could see how proud he was. And we got, we got applause from the white people as well as the black people, which surprised me. Mm. And I think you wrote that that was a moment when it kind of gave lie to the, to the whole notion of white supremacy, right? Just <laughs> Absolutely. Because we had been, I see you read my book. You see, we, we had been told in more ways than one that we were the inferior race and they were the superior race. And so once you hear that enough, it's like Pavlov's dog. You just get conditioned to that. You don't even know you being conditioned. But uh, here was proof, living proof that uh, we were, I can't even say as good. We were simply better than they were. <laughs> and that just buoyed our spirits. Yeah. I could try uh -huh. to be democratic and not be nationalist, <laughs> but on that day, <laughs> we were better. You're just telling the, telling the objective history there. <laughs> That's right. I was there. I'm the historian. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I was, I was thinking about when I was um, thinking about your history is that, you know, it's now been almost 70 years since the Brown decision and schools across the country in some places are, are still deeply racially segregated. In fact, as you know, there's the court case right now in New Jersey challenging school segregation here. I'm, I'm just curious, you know, you having, having lived through this, what is it like to, to see that, that so many schools are, you know, remain segregated? Well, the, the, the grandeur, the allure, if you will, that's a better word, of uh, integration has long since left me. Hmm. Uh, when I became a part of the uh, Black Power Awareness, one of the things we realized was that we don't need to be with white people to, be, to feel who we are, to, to know who we are and to do well. So desegregation has not worked to fortify people in that respect. Hmm. Uh, 
what desegregation does or integration, uh, it gives you an opportunity to see just what white people are like and how they operate. I don't mean that necessarily in a, a defamatory way. I'm just saying I went, I went four years at Amherst College and three years at Yale Law School. I know white people. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen them up close and personal. I've seen them up close. <laughs> they put their pants on in the morning just like I do. <laughs> you know, that's what desegregation does. Mm. It doesn't really help the race. It helps those individuals who have been exposed. Hmm. So uh, I have this argument with Ken Clark. You know, Ken Clark was the man who said, we have to be integrated with white people in order to, to, to feel equal and to be equal. And that was part of the proof that was put before the court in the Brown case. Uh, so be it, Ken Clark and I, Ken Clark and I uh, had a, a great friendship hmm. when I, I did some consultant work for him uh, in the 1960s over uh, in, in New York with his organization called Mark, M-A-R-C. Hmm. He, it was like a father-son battle, uh, always respectful with great humor, but uh, we both held our positions. And my argument was that we need to have an education system that reflects who we are as Black people. Hmm. And what we have, have, have uh, done is to allow white people to tell us who we are in one way, one more way, and that's the education of our children. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, my favorite education opportunity for young people, public school young people uh, in New Jersey was the Abbott case, mm -hmm. Abbott versus Burt which was a reflection of several things. I'm gonna write about this one day. Number one, it was saying, you have to go into the communities and make the schools better where they are. Hmm. Whoever's in those schools, you make those schools better. And uh, number two, it was a form of reparations, although people didn't think of it as such. The, the, the black people and the Latino people didn't think of it as such. Uh, the white people certainly did, because they said, well, we're gonna stop this. You're giving all that money. You're giving our money to, to all these black and brown kids. Now, the case was not decided on race. It was decided on economics. It said that poor people should not be deprived of an equal education simply because they don't have the money in their district to pay for the quality education. And people say, well, education is not tied to the money. Well, you, you tell that to the people in Short Hills who raise their education budget every year just to, to, to keep up with the education demands as they perceive it. Does that mean that it's a, a better form of education? Well, apparently they think it is, and we wanted to make sure we got all the resources that we needed to have to, uh, to afford that kind of education. Does that mean Abbott was the best thing in the world? Nope. For example, uh, it did not include any kind of emphasis on the arts, mm. and you can't teach black and brown kids who they are and expect them to do well without including the arts as a priority. Mm. Do you think the case, you know, the, the current case is, is, like I mentioned, it's still in, in the courts, but let's say the state was found liable for the segregation and it was ordered to make changes. What do you think the response would be in the state? How do you think that would go over among parents and, and, and people in the state if, if desegregation was ordered? Resistance on the part of whites, uh, great acceptance on the part of blacks and browns. Mm. Uh, the, the resistance on the part of white people would be just like it was with the Abbott case. They do not mm -hmm. want to see black people to get over in their minds. They do not want to see black people taking their resources. They don't want to see them in their spaces. They don't want to be around them. I mean, I'm being as, as, as frank as I can be about that because I've seen it. Mm. You can come and visit. You can be in the schools, but uh, you can't stay there. I, I did 
many years I have a singing group called Return to the Source. And we were a part of a network called Young Audiences. And we were, we were bringing our music to these districts. Mm. Uh, gorgeous schools, wonderful schools. Uh, I, I could see the, the facilities were much better. And I said, yeah, it would be nice to have this for our children. But the form of education that was going on in those schools, I didn't necessarily agree with. That's my position. Mm. So from the standpoint of Black people, young, younger and not so young parents who want to see their kids get ahead, and they realize that there's only one chance you get to make it right for these kids, they would go for that. Mm. And they, they, they wouldn't would allow the conflict. It would be just like, uh, just like down south, just with a more gentle touch. You wouldn't have the violence, but there would be certainly a, a, a political uh, awakening among the white suburbanites to keep black people where they are and to make sure that their children didn't have to come to the urban school. Mm. Yeah, which is the history usually of, of right. It's usually the students of color that are the ones that have to travel to right. other school. And, and, and that might be, I'm just thinking here, that might be the uh, waking for a new Abbott program. Hmm. All right, you guys, uh, instead of coming up here, we'll send you some more money to stay down there. Hmm. That's race and racism in America. Hmm. I know a lot of people out there who are listening to this, whatever your audience may be, are going to say, well, he's hard. He's racist. He doesn't really think we can all get along. I, on bread and butter, things like education, no. Hmm. They, it's, they're a hard and fast line. It's been proven. I'm historically correct, and I don't see any evidence that that has changed. Mm. That dichotomy that I explained to you just now, that's the way it's going to be. And, and, your, and your feeling of that is, is based in your study of history, right? Based on study of history and based on my living it. Mm. Well, yeah, and, and on that point, I wanted to talk a little about your, your activism. Um, I know that when you were still at Amherst College is when you traveled down to Montgomery, correct, and joined the Students for Nonviolent um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and were organizing for Black voting rights. And then, right. not long after that, I think you were still in law school when you went to Newark and, and joined the um, Students for Democratic Society organizing. Right. And then, um, and then still in your 20s when you were helping, um, when you really led the organization or helped lead um, the opposition to the medical school campus um, that was going to displace so many people in Newark. Um, right. And it just, when I, was, when I was reading about that, it just struck me how young you were and, and you know, your, your colleagues um, when you were doing that organizing. Um, so I just want to ask, what, what role do you think young people play in in past event organizing like civil rights movement and then more recent uh, movements like the LGBTQ rights and Black Lives Matter. What, you know, what is the role of young people in that kind of work? Well, without the energy and the fearlessness of the youth, any movement will peter out and just be less than what it really is capable of. Uh, if we look at the voter rights movement now, uh, we see some young people, but I don't see the enthusiastic support of young people that I saw in my era because uh, we, we, we wanted to vote. We saw vote as the, the, the not, not just the uh, exhibition of democracy, uh, ex exhibition of democratic the democratic aspect of America, but we said, well, voting is power. Uh, young people don't see that today because our politicians, the people we put in office have not been held accountable for what they do or don't do. Mm. So instead of young people saying, well, hey, we got to figure out how to hold these people accountable. They just said, well, hell with the vote. Some, I'm not saying all, but some, a sufficient number of people came out to help Biden get elected. Uh, but I doubt that Biden, if Biden were to run today, he would not get the enthusiastic support of young people mm. as he did because uh, the politicians have just not produced what they mm. said they're going to produce. Uh, the vote, the, the school, the school, uh, the, the, the free school for people to go to community colleges, 
the two years of that, it was taken off the table. The mm-hmm. whole, uh, and and uh, something that uh, Biden doesn't need anybody to do, the whole question of school debt. We got young people walking around here with just overwhelming debt. And that's something the president can just write off with a flick of his bick. That's an old, uh, for, for folks who don't know, a bick, B-I-C. <laughs> <laughs> a flick of my bit. That was a pen. You know, it's a pen that I'm talking about. No, no, no other connotation, please. But, we won't censor this. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that the <clears throat> any movement uh, will have to be sustained by young, not young people. Now, number two, what I have seen. There are some young people who think that they must maintain a street presence rather than a seat in the big house. Hmm. And I said, and again, I come back to my, my memoir. I said, you need the power in the suites and you need the power in the street. Hmm. The power in the street must use the power in the suite and vice versa. Uh, what we have examples of of that not happening is uh, President Obama had the the best list of, of of any president, probably Biden second of young people. Call them up. You know, you want to get this man in as your man in the uh, Supreme Court, and uh, the Republicans wouldn't let him do that for what nine months. Mm-hmm. We never heard a whimper. Too bad. It happened. Okay, well, why not get young people to see what's going on and how powerful that seat is mm. and get a, a, a movement from the street mm. to force the Republicans' hand? That well, didn't happen. I mean, you do so, see that a little bit, right, with, um, for example, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez getting into politics after organizing, I think, around the 2016 election. So there's, it seems like there's some movement, but you, you feel like it's still mainly focused on the organizing part and less on the political, mo- political side of things. Well, like I'm saying, it's both. She, she was, she came from becoming a bartender in, uh, in New York to become a congressperson. And that's good. You're moving into this. But she comes back and says, well, people, young people, you got to do things. Old people, young people, you got to do things to make democracy better. That's why she goes out and finds other people who will be uh, in the seats just like her and endorse with her endorsements with with Bernie. Mm. Uh, And I appreciate that coming from her. She's not the person that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who get into City Hall, for example, and then do nothing but feather their own nest. Mm. They bring their friends in, they give them awards, but they don't make sure that the organization that brought them there uh, is being uh, necessarily uh, funded or uh, helped in some kind of way to keep up the kind of pressure that uh, had to be done to get them in office. Hmm. And when we elected the first black mayor in Newark, Ken Gibson, and he said this to his credit, he was elected by the civil rights movement. That's what he said. But it really wasn't just the civil rights movement. It was the Black Power movement and the civil rights movement that put him in. It was not the Democratic Party. There mm-hmm. were no smoke-filled back room. We rammed him into City Hall. Mm-hmm. Now, once he got there, he forgot the bridge that brought him over. That's a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Where you don't go back to your base, you don't make sure that it's alive, that it's healthy, that can help you get things done. Hmm. And and when that happens, when elected officials who had the support of the community but seem to lose touch with the community, do you think that that kind of makes young people cynical or, or, or you know skeptical about even getting into politics when they see that happen? Absolutely. Not just young people, but especially young people. Because hmm. we came at it with a certain amount of optimism, just to use the Gibson election as an example. In that first Gibson election, 74% of the eligible voters in Newark came out to vote. Hmm. Now, that's just not the people who were for Gibson, but the people who were against Gibson. 
74% of the people came out to vote. Wow. Can, can, I mean, have you, have you ever heard of such a number? When I, find, when I saw it, when I saw the analysis in the newspaper, what? <laughs> That's how many of us came out? And it's been going down ever since. Mm. Doom, 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 doom. Every now and then you get a, an uptick, you get a little flurry of interest. Baraka, the current mayor of Newark, has a, has a very ardent following. But uh, there are a lot of people who don't vote now. Mm. And that's historically true, especially with school board elections, right? They tend to vote. Absolutely. 10% is a high number. Usually it's down around 5% of the eligible vote. But how do we get people to come out and understand that uh, you have you have a control of your future because you control the school board? That's the closest thing next to the police that you can get hmm. to the people themselves. Hmm. Another part of your work that I was noticing was that, you know, as you've been doing this organizing, you've also tried to share a lot of the lessons that you've learned yourself through the Abbott Leadership Institute, where you're training parents and students on advocacy around schools and in your memoir that you mentioned and your new podcast. It seems like part of your work is, is passing on the lessons of organizing that you've learned. Um, can you just talk about why, why you've committed to that, to trying to share those those lessons? Because I learned a long time ago that I'm not going to be here forever mm -hmm. and that uh, I'm not going to be able to do all the things that we want to get done in this lifetime. So you have to pass it on. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right. I've been doing that uh, with the Abbott Leadership Institute, the Youth Media Symposium. The, uh, the Now I have the website, which is called uh, riseupnewark.com. We had over a million people that looked at, at that. I stopped counting after the first 18 months, hmm. uh, which is a history of black power and resistance in Newark, but also an analysis of what the other ethnic groups were doing in Newark uh, as the same, at the same time as black aspirations were tamped down, hmm. white aspirations from the ethnic group perspective were tapped up. Hmm. So that's the lesson there. And uh, as you, as you, you, and you're right. Now my podcast is called uh, "Everything's Political," and one can find that on Spotify and all the other usual places. Uh, it's uh, "Everything's Political," no apostrophe, just one word. Everything's Political. Dot Fireside. Dot FM. Maybe you can put that sure. up somewhere for people to see it. My most recent episode that's up now is called "Do Women Make." the best organizers hmm. and the women of course say do you really need to ask that question and I tell <laughs> folks, well you we're trying to draw folks here give me a break here give me a break and we have a very lively discussion about uh what has happened with women when they get involved in social justice movement and have to deal with men hmm. and sorry to keep going back to it but obviously we chalk be just focus on education that's that's certainly an area where I feel like women tend to be the leaders of the organizing is in, around schools and education. Right, the work, if you want the work done, you get the women involved, <laughs> simple as that. Now, a lot of women just uh, don't have a chance to be leaders because the men push them aside and jump up in front of the camera. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's part of the, uh, the, the flip side of the success that we had in, in various kinds of social justice movements. So we need to stop that. Mm. And another um, aspect of your work is, as we've been talking about, is around history. And um, in New Jersey, we have the Amistad Law, which I believe was passed in 2002, that was meant to make sure that students are learning about African-American history, slavery, the contributions of Black Americans. But over the years, I think it's, there have been questions about its implementation and I you know, heard residents in Newark talk about it not being uh, carried out in schools as much as they'd like, but the new leadership of the Newark Public Schools is, is working on changing that and creating a new curriculum. And I've heard they've asked you to help with that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that work? Right, right. Well, the first thing we did, uh, we, we put together a curriculum based on the website, Rise Up Newark, Dot com. Uh, we've also 
started a website similar to that in Detroit, riseupdetroit.org. Mm. Hopefully that will be finished or at least almost finished sometime next month or oh, well, in April. Uh, but back to Newark, uh, my, my lead researcher and I put together, Peter Blackman, we put together a, uh, a curriculum based on the city of Newark. Mm. And this was on the Amistad because not, not only were we looking at the white ethnic groups who rose to power, we were, we were comparing that in the mind's eye of the young people who see this with the black, the, the black progress. How did we get power in Newark? So that's being used in 10 high schools already. Hmm. Hopefully it will be more. Right now they have asked me to look at some of the other curricula that they have proposed and to propose some alternative curriculum curricula with uh, that in mind all the way from kindergarten up through uh, middle school thus far. Hmm. So yes, okay. I'm very much involved in it. I appreciate the, the work that the, the superintendent is doing with respect to that and his staff because uh, it couldn't be done without them. Mm. And, and are you in particular helping them with the, the Newark part of the history? Well, with respect to the, the work that I'm doing right now, it's more general. Mm. It's, like, it's like, for example, if I'm gonna be looking at uh, the history of, uh, of Africa, do we treat Africa like a country? You got to make sure that it's a continent and you're looking at a whole lot of people and uh, you don't shy away from words like colonialism and slavery. And if you're looking at uh, the American scene, well, you, you make sure that if we're going to talk about black people, we don't start the history with slavery. We go back to where they were, where Africans were uh, before Africans were brought to this country to be enslaved. What was civilization like? Mm -hmm. you know, we want young people to understand that the, the mother of civilization is the continent of Africa. Not only did the first people come from there, but the first great civilizations uh, came from Africa. And as people moved north, they became different and they brought some, civil, some aspects of civilization for African civilization with them, but they also came up with ideas of their own. And all of this is what has uh, impacted uh, uh, impacted the world today. Mm. So we want people to get a worldview that's really, uh, I don't like the word democratic, but just reflective of the world as it really is, as opposed to a homogenized white perspective, which is, again, we can't get away from that word, white supremacy oriented. Mm. So that's what I'm doing. I'm glad that they are, they are Roger Leone and his staff is comfortable with that notion. Yeah. And I mean, I know this seems kind of self-explanatory, but I feel like it is being debated right now. Why is it so important for students to get that full, truthful history that includes contributions of, of Black people that hit, you know, going back to Africa, but also the oppression and, and, and white supremacy? Why, why is that so important that kids get that full story? Well, that takes me back to that sidewalk confrontation in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm where people of color have been taught, still, you ain't mm, compared with white people. And so it's necessary, it's not just nice, it's necessary that people learn who they are, who the, that they come from something that's much better than you have really been told has happened. Uh, you can't expect people to do well in, in, in math test, and uh, whatever other kinds of skills are, pres are prescribed these days, if they don't feel good about who they are, mm. all of that becomes irrelevant. Now, if, you, if, if you're thinking that people can write and you're thinking that people can read and you're thinking that people can do math and they have a healthy thought about who they are, then they will want to pass those tests. But if you don't have that kind of motivation, if you don't have that incentive to think well about who you are, well, you're not going to do very well. And that's why people be, be kind of fall off and become part of uh, the margins and engage in the underground economy because they just don't think they have any other options. Mm. And, and then Newark in particular has such a rich history. Um, 
and you've been a part of some of the pivotal moments here. Are, are there certain key periods of history or moments or, or themes from Newark's history that you would like to see Newark students learning about? Yeah, one of, one of my big future projects, hopefully not too far in the future, is to examine the role of music hmm. in Newark. Newark is a music city. Hmm. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, you've got people from like Sarah Vaughan and, and uh, Dionne Warwick and Whitney Houston. Uh, all of these people have roots in Newark, not just in Newark, but in Newark music. Mm. So I want to do a three-part documentary. One would be jazz, number two would be gospel, and number three would be R&B, rhythm and blues. Mm. Talk about the great artists who came through here and the impact of music on, on, on Newark. Hmm. So I want to I want to do that for everybody, but I want to do I want to make sure it gets into the school system as part of the curriculum. I feel like that's something that students would really enjoy learning. Oh yeah, see that, that, that one of the things that has happened, and not just in Newark, uh, and I tell my my kids this and my wife all the time, and they they kind of laugh at me, but I talk about the dumbing down of American music. Hmm. The, 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 the music that was so rich in texture and content. I don't have a thing against hip hop. I like hip hop as an art form. I've written some hip hop for my group, Return to the Source. Mm. Uh, but to me, hip hop is great poetry with a beat. Now you juxtapose that with the tradition that started with the spirituals, which came to the blues, which led to the evolution of jazz, gospel, rhythm and blues, and then hip hop. All of that stuff that's underneath hip hop is missing from our understanding. And that's the music that's always gonna keep my head rocking, <laughs> keep, my, keep myself just moving with the beat. With, my, with the beat, on the second and four, as opposed to the one and the three. <laughs> Think about that, y'all. Think about <laughs> And you're a musician yourself. You, am I right that you play harmonica? Yes, I started. I remember now, I told you my father was uh, the band director. My mother was also a music teacher. So mm. music was part of the fabric of my family. Mm. I started with the piano, lost interest because my brother could play better than me. Uh, eventually, uh, my father introduced us to some other kinds of instruments, a trumpet for my father, for, for, my, for my brother, a clarinet for me. I went from clarinet to saxophone uh, and drums. And then most recent, my most recent iteration has been uh, the harmonica, the blues harmonica and the chromatic harmonica. Mm. That'll be, we'll have to do another conversation just about your, your music at one point. <laughs> now I want to do that. I want to do that. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to make sure I ask you about um, related to history, kind of an, the opposite movement that's going on right now. As Newark is working to make sure students are learning a full history, there's a lot of places in the country that are trying to restrict what history students are taught. Um, the last I saw, at least 36 states in the past year or so have adopted or introduced policies that would restrict teaching about race and racism. Um, talking about things like white privilege or structural racism, even things that would make students feel guilty or discomfortable um, about the past. So, you know, as someone who's steeped in history, what, what are your thoughts when you see these efforts to limit what students can learn? Two things. It's not only those states that have restricted full exploration of important points and parts of our history, it's the liberal states as well. Mm. I, I mentioned to you uh, that they, the, the whole Abbott phenomena, Abbott versus Burke solutions, didn't think that it was important enough to include things like music and drama and poetry. That's not emphasized. And you back off and you say, what are the other things are not being taught in the schools these days 
and the emphasis is just on passing those tests and you see how well you read and how well you count. Well, everybody can do those if, as I pointed out, you're motivated to do that. Mm -hmm. But you got to have something else that's going to help people feel important about themselves. So we've already kind of downplayed education, mm -hmm. real education. Now, with respect to the other folks who in those 36 states, that has happened because of the killing of George Floyd. Mm. When George Floyd was killed, and for nine minutes, everybody in the world saw a Black man being murdered. There's a matter of fact, about one cop in particular, but two others were his assistants. Something went off in the minds of young people, especially young white people who were watching mm. that in this country. And for the first time, there were more white people in the streets in some places than black people protesting that death. Mm. And the white folks in charge said, whoa, what's going on here? Because, and then some of the adults who were in charge of places in, 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 the, in, the, in the suburbs, they looked at these situation and uh, they were saying we, re we really don't know what's going on with black america they're saying that there's white privilege and we saw it and we got to talk about that mm. we got to really study it and got to do something about it that's when the reaction came when the young white people want to know that perhaps it's not so good to be white quote unquote it's not so good to have this privilege. It's not so, so that this privilege is driving us in, in, in economic ways, in social ways, in political ways. And we ought to do something about it. We need to learn more. That's when the folks in charge said, we got to stop this shit. Hmm. That's the history of it. Hmm. And that's why it's so live in, in places where uh, the red states, but also the blue states. You said 36 states. I mean, that's a whole lot of blue states too. Yeah, folks don't want the truth to come out. Hmm. And and that in a kind of weird backhanded way that seems to endorse how important history is. If it's if it's concerning lawmakers that you know students would learn the truth, the full history, and that might you know radicalize them in some way. That that seems to su suggest they realize how powerful learning history can be. The truth will set you free. <laughs> The last thing I wanted to ask you, then I'll let you go, is, um, you know, again, I've just been looking at, at all your work over the years um, up to today, and it looks like you're not stopping anytime soon. Um, but in, in the, the moments of history that you've been a part of, I'm just wondering, you know, when you think about what your legacy will be and how your story will be told, um, what, what would you like to see? What, what would you hope that will be? Hmm. Uh... Well, it's this. I mean, the kinds of things we're talking about right now. I want to uh, educate people. I want to pass on the, the knowledge that I have, the knowledge that we've accumulated. I want to pass on the knowledge that I learned from standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I, I want to pass on the knowledge that I've gained from fighting the midgets who continue to nip at your heels. Uh, but you got to get on with your life. I want all those kinds of lessons to be passed on. And uh, I've, I've chosen to adopt the kinds of uh, opportunities that uh, have been made possible with this, this digital age. Although I am not a digital person, I, I'm surrounded by people right here in my house, my friends, people I tend to associate with who do know how to use the internet and how to use the, 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 the Wi-Fi. To, to reach a whole new group of people. You, you talked about my, uh, my, my latest chance to do that has been with this uh, Everything's Political that I'm doing, the podcast. Everybody's doing that. So the challenge is, how do you make your podcast stand out? Mm. And how, how, do you, how do you still continue to speak truth to power? And I have been able, to, I've been fortunate enough to have people who agree with me and who see this as part of our collective legacy and have helped me do that. So I'm going to keep on doing it as long as I can. It seems like it. And I, and I will say too, I've been listening to your podcast. It, you seem pretty well suited for that, 
format. I think you're pretty good at it. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I enjoy. <laughs> All right, sir. Well, well, thank you again so much for taking the time. It's It's been so great to, to talk to you. Okay. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care and hope to talk to you again soon. All right.